Okay, so welcome to the Happy Mindset Show, episode number seven. Today's episode is entitled Keeping It Real. And today I'm joined by mm. Gabriella Maldonado uh, Montana. Montana. I hope I got that right. <laughs> uh, Gabriella, she's, uh, she's a woman doing some great stuff. She's been doing it for quite a while now. She's been uh, positively helping to facilitate change in communities, multicultural communities, businesses, and uh, prisons and hospitals, to name a few different things. Um, and for anybody who isn't familiar with you, Gabriella, could you give a, just a brief introduction to yourself that, to cover a little bit more? Well, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, well, I have been learning about the principles um, since 1996. Uh, it's been a wonderful um, ride. It's been a wonderful ride. Dennis, because um, just it has really just understanding these principles has seeped through every area of my life, you know, my personal life, my relationship, my work life. And I started off at 14 wanting to know, wanting to help people. Like I knew very early on that I wanted to, to be with people and, mm -hmm. and particularly with children. And I had my, my little plan of life, right? And I was going to get a, a PhD and I was going to go work kids doing art therapy. And then you know what happens, life happens. And then of course, all of that gets changed. Um, and through a divorce, uh, and while I was working at a nonprofit, I learned about the principles and then it just sort of took over my life really. Mm. Um, and so you're right. I was I have been working with a lot of different kinds of people in nonprofits, um, then for the County of Santa Clara, uh, later on for the Center for Sustainable Change, which is another nonprofit. Um, and then just, uh, I had a LLC with Elise Coit that was called True Change Consultant. And more recently, I've just been working on my own doing trainings and facilitation around the world, you know, in English and in Spanish. And so, mm -hmm. so I've had a, a rich, rich experience with this. Cool. So how did you know, like, how did you know you wanted to help people? Like you said, you mentioned when you were 14, you had this desire within you to help people. Like where did that come from? Do you think? My spirit, yeah. <laughs> my spirit. I just really like deeply, uh, I don't know, you know, I just really felt that from my heart to come out and it's like, you know, I want to work with people. And then was it art I therapy like, you were thinking of to start off with? Is that because you, were you interested in art yourself or? Yes, my dad was actually a painter. Uh, and so I always was, as a child, I was around art and, you know, I'm from Mexico City and in Mexico the arts are valued and color and all of that and um, I actually for a while thought well I should major in art and then I heard how hard it is for artists to make a living so I was like okay wait <laughs> let me just kind of combine that with something else and so I have a minor in art and I really enjoy creating you know and it just sort of felt to me like a really good fit this idea of working with kids Mm -hmm. doing something creative, right, rather than just talking to them. Yeah. And so um, kind of that was that was the path. And I love working with kids, too. I just always have had an affinity and a joy around children. So that's what happened. Cool. And um, so your plans changed quite a bit. How did you come across? So the three principles are pretty much uh, mind consciousness and thought. They're the, the logic behind it. State of mind is the way I kind of referred to but how did you come to um to that understanding looking back on it now how did like how did that come into your life well i was working at a nonprofit here in santa clara county which is in the state of california and santa clara county is where the silicon valley is you know mm -hmm. san jose and Palo Alto and all of that. And um, the nonprofit that i worked for received funding from the department of alcohol and drug services which is part of the Santa Clara County. And the director at the time was Bob Gardner. And so he invited all the agencies that were receiving funding 
through his department to attend a training. Mm. And the first training that I went to was with um, Dr. Roger Mills. Um, and I wasn't really looking for it. I was kind of told, okay, you're going to go to a training. And so I went and I was going through the divorce, my divorce and, uh, not feeling well, I was feeling really crappy. And, mm. and then I heard Roger say, there's a part of you that cannot be touched no matter what's happening to you, what has happened or what will happen to you. And I just remember feeling like all the cells in my body remembering, you know, it just mm-hmm. went like, ding, like an alarm, like an alarm in your, in your uh, phone, you know. I was like, yes, how could I forget that, right? Mm-hmm. And I just immediately felt better. I just went, I knew that. I knew that in my heart. I knew it in my soul because of a lot of experiences that I went through as a child and just I had noticed my own resiliency. Mm-hmm. So um, that's how I came across it and it just sort of changed the way that we worked in in the agency and in my, in my department. I was at the time working with kids at school doing prevention work, alcohol and drug prevention and we were using the disease model and then the next week we just went to talk about resiliency and change and all of that. And um, it just really immediately changed and did my, re- my career, for sure. Did, <clears throat> did it start resonating with people quite quickly then when you when you went about trying to start teaching this kind of understanding? With the kids? Yeah. Um, I, was, I was trying to work it, to, yeah, to share with the kids. And, you know, I was super clumsy about it because... I was thinking, okay, how do we, how do we translate this, you know, mm. for kids? It's quite a big thing. And so, right? <laughs> so I just, I, w- I remember just kind of experimenting and saying, do you know how when you go to the movies with a friend, like you might like the movie and the other person might not like the movie? And they're like, yes. And I said, well, that's because you're thinking. You know, and so I just kind of like was pointing to mm. our capacity that we have to create our own experience, right? Mm. Um, and I was working with kids that at one point that were deep in trouble and just explaining to them this capacity that they have for resiliency. You could feel them just relax, you know, just kind of rest. And so... I loved seeing that, Dennis. I loved seeing humans just kind of, uh, you know. Yeah, we just sort of relief pretty much kind of. Yeah, yeah kind of um, gain hope, hmm. you know, trust in life and trust in, in a capacity to, to be okay. Um, and then I worked with a lot of incarcerated kids and just noticed how in the moment they could be brilliant and they can, um, gain their bearings and, um, have a sense of humor and all of that. So I guess that the, the, the most difficult thing at the time was just my, um, by experimenting, you know, it's like, okay, how do I say this? How do I do this? And then a lot of the time I would just play with them. Like I would figure out ways to play with them. But one time, this was really interesting because one time I was working with fourth graders and I would reflect a lot on, okay, what can I use with the kids? What kind of story can I, can I share with them or what kind of toy could I bring or what kind of experience can I share with them that would point to the principles. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I did is um, I would talk to them and show them the Wizard of Oz. Because in the Wizard of Oz, you know, our three characters actually have already what they were looking for inside of them. Mm -hmm. And I was explaining that to the kids one day and I said, but they thought that they didn't have it. And so they thought that they had to look for them outside of themselves. 
And this young girl, she must have been like nine or ten, and she said, oh, my gosh. And I said, what? She goes, this is what has happened to me with homework. And I'm all, what's happened to you with homework? She says, well, I have seen my brother not like homework. And then I started thinking that I didn't like homework either. But that's because of my brother's thinking, not because of my own thinking. And that blew my mind. And then that that kind of, that shifted in her from that moment, was it like she didn't, that's pretty, yeah. Kind of remarkable, right? For a little kid to realize that. Exactly, to see it in like the homework, it's kind of like you would have thought that that's, not like you from looking in you kind of go like that's you wouldn't think a child would pick up on how related that is there um that the homework's the same as over here the the, the Oz thing um mm-hmm. so what actually what how do you find children are for getting this type of stuff can they grasp the logic behind how the mind is working from these kind of analogies and pointing stuff out and that kind of thing um absolutely You know, absolutely. Like just before we started the program, I was telling you how I was in Spain, right? Mm. And I was in northern Spain and I was visiting a colleague of mine and she's very interested in doing uh, work with the kids at school. And so she asked me if I would be willing to go into a school and just talk to the kids for an hour. And uh, I was like, sure. So this is in the Rioja district. Uh, Shout out to my friend Begonia. Uh, Bego, you know who you are. (laughs) And uh, we just had an hour and the school said, okay, we're going to give you two opportunities. One of them to be with these kids that are like having a lot of difficulties, right? With a lot of problems. And we sat down with the principal and we sat down with a, I think like the the school psychologist and they were saying, you know, these kids um, are socially challenged and they're some of them were immigrants and, you know, they're not learning. And they just started pointing out the description of what we're seeing as far as behavior from a, you know, adult perspective. And so we're like, okay, so we went in there now. We only have 45 minutes, right? And, and the magic of working with kids is that they've taught me how to get present very quickly, right? Like, and they're raw, so why do you think that? Why, kind of, or why do you think that is? Why, 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 why is it that it's children that you become more present than with an adult? Or well, for me, from my experience, is because they're raw. Mm. You know, like an adult might be willing to pretend that they're listening and to pretend that they're paying attention, and with the kids, are just so obvious that oh my god, this is so boring, right? They're so yeah, I get you, yeah. Yeah. unplugged, right? that you just kind of either run or you get present. And I've learned to get present, really present very quickly through them, Mm -hmm. right? They've helped my my work a lot. Anyway, so we just sat down in a circle and we started talking, you know, we started talking about their favorite things and what they like to eat and the worst thing they've ever eaten and, you know, all this stuff. And we just started talking to them a little bit about thinking, just a little bit about thinking, and at the end, towards the end of, the, of, our, of our conversation, one of the girls said, and this is a girl that has had issues every day this year, this school year. Okay? And this is what she said. You know, last year, I would not pay attention to all the other kids. I would just not even think about it. And I was fine. I was happy. And this year, I'm paying attention to them, and look what's happened. So those kind of insights that kids can have, right? Mm -hmm. From my experience, is they can have very, very deep insights in a moment, just as deep as any adult, Mm -hmm. right? And so the, the other thing that I, that, you know, the question and this, this girl responded, I said, okay, so through thinking, why do we create? And she says, well, we create our well-being and we also create when, well, in Spanish is malestar, but in English is like when we're not well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we are 
insightful people, all of us humans, even if we're young. Mm. And all of us can have an insight about our own functioning. And all of us can notice our wisdom, right? And all of us can notice our own thinking and our own capacity to create difficulties for ourselves. And so I've noticed that that's true. I mean, you know, I've worked with kids that are five. Oh, I'll give you another example because this was like, this blew my mind. I had these um, young clients. So they were five and seven and this just happened maybe like two months ago. And so I would go to their home right after school and I would sit with their parents. Their parents actually knew about the principles and they had gone to um, some of the trainings in Santa Clara County. Um, and so the girls were kind of acting out a little bit and, and I was in their bedroom with the parents sitting down, just kind of talking, you know, so I don't sit down and say, okay, you know, this is your thinking and, you know, you have the power to create, you know, a lot of it is just me getting very, very present. Mm. And, and while I'm present, it will occur to me something about something that I want to share with them or ask them questions or something. And so the little one started having tantrums like the older one. And so the parents said to me, you know, the older one is actually done wonderful this week, but the little one is really acting out. So I said, huh, that's interesting. Well, let's call her. Let's find out. You know, let's see what's going on. So I sat her on my lap. You know, the parents are there. I'm on the floor. And I said, you know, what's going on, honey? You know, I heard that you're having tantrums. And so what's happening? And she said, you know, I really get scared sometimes. And I just need to be held so I can calm down. Right? Mm. And so... I mean, I get chills right now telling you this because we were all in the room. And w before I asked her, we were all kind of throwing ideas as to why this was happening, you know? Yeah. We were theorizing. And, the, and when we asked her, it was just so clear. It was just so clear from a five-year-old, like, what's going on, right? Mm. And then the mom said, well, honey, sometimes I hug you and you still act out. She goes, yeah, I know. I know. So what I found in working with kids is that wisdom comes through. Why wouldn't it? Mm. Right? That's amazing that like a five-year-old could be that clear and precise in what they actually wanted when it came down to it. Yeah. Is it the space it's, that's it's, coming it's, from? Or like, do you think it's because you were receptive to that, that, that she opened up or kind of, uh, does that allow for clarity to come through? I suppose it's hard for you to maybe, uh, say but um it's just for me what struck me there was very precise and i've never really maybe seen that myself too, too much that a child to be that precise and what they actually wanted that uh, i know for myself that it's when i'm in a space where i feel like i can open up and say something that that's when i get very direct and clear on things i'm just wondering maybe mm -hmm. if that's, that's the same for a child as well maybe you know i i don't know in my experience is that I really have learned a lot about working with people through kids. I mean, a lot. Because I've had, you know, a decade of working with them. And what I've noticed is that, and I noticed that with this kid, okay? Like when I was just talking to the parents, what I noticed is that I would come up with an idea as to why this was happening. Mm -hmm. The parents would come up with an idea as to why this was happening. And from that idea, then we developed a strategic as to how to be helpful to the kid. But then it just sort of occurred to me, wait, well, let's just ask this kid what's happening. Yeah. Right? Let's just ask him. So I think there's a couple of things. I think as adults, we don't realize that kids can be wise and they can actually communicate well. I think we have an idea that they can't. Mm. And that we need to teach them and that they're not able to express this. And so we get entangled in that. And I think a lot of the times we create strategies to try to help them, but we identify the wrong issue or the wrong problem. Hmm. So, you know, in working with kids, what I've noticed is that 
and like in adults too, this is true for adults, is that when you get really present and you get from the, you know, you adopt the, the, the perspective of, you know, I don't know. Let's investigate this together. Let me understand this. But you see the human being in front of you as, as, as a little being or an older being full of wisdom and having a capacity to have insight. It's just amazing what shows up, right? Mm. I mean, this is true for adults too. Yeah. It takes the pressure off because you know that the wisdom is inside them then rather than trying to, I suppose, more of a, it's more of an opportunity for a conversation and a more natural conversation to arise rather than me knowing stuff that can help you. Um, mm-hmm. I think, you know, and that's kind of the way I look at it. Mm-hmm. And kids, Dennis, have, I think, like a, uh, a really awareness. I mean, they're, I mean, uh, we as adults, we do too, but what I have encountered with kids is that this capacity f- for them to notice is really heightened, you know? That's true. Like they can tell. They do seem to pick up on things quicker. They can see true stuff that's not... They, they, I suppose they, they've got like a... I think they're more in tune with their feeling kind of sense. They can feel things better than maybe we can as adults. Sometimes we can get lost in our own kind of misunderstandings of how things work sometimes and they're more maybe more clear to the... Maybe they're just not more closer to the source of wisdom because they're just newer into the world, maybe, to an extent. There's not too much thinking going on there to clutter up their feeling level of things. Yeah, I think that's the only thing that's happening. You know, I think the only thing that's happening is they just don't get entangled as much, usually, yeah. in their own thinking. And so they can tell. I, I tell you, you know, I love the the title of this conversation, Keeping It Real, because you want to keep it real but work with kids yeah. they'll teach you <laughs> they'll really teach you so how did you actually find that like you were saying <clears throat> there's a bit of trial and error to this like did you find that was hard to do while you're going through it or was it like because I know myself when I when I put myself out there and I f- I'm willing to fail at stuff it's not like it's like a, a magic cure to things it's like I still have to go through the feelings and stuff like that but it's um I suppose it helps to know that the only way to progress is to actually have some element of failure. So how did um how did that work for you there when you're kind of like not sure how to approach this and you're kind of like how do, how will people resonate with this and how, in hindsight how how did that kind of work itself out for you? Well, um, again, um, working with kids was just the 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 most. It's like it was like working 3D, you know. It was like cause adults are a little bit more willing to like be polite and you know, like, oh, okay, we understand, right? But kids are like, no, right? And so, in working with, I think the experience that comes to mind is um, again working in Santa Clara County at a school. It was a what do you call that? A, a continuation school and a continuation school is a school for kids that have not been successful in regular schooling, right? And so we were working with a continuation school that was the last stop for the kids. And I was there with uh, Amy Mills, another shout out to my, my buddy, Amy Mills, <laughs> full of shout out. This uh, and Amy's dad was Roger, right? And so we walked into this school, you know, and this school is surrounded by, by wire, like a wire fence, a link fence. Mm -hmm. And we walk in there and the kids are playing basketball, right? And they they look rough. And uh, all the school are like mobile trailers, right? So it's not like a regular building. Mm -hmm. And this was, this was my, my, my first day, my first hour in the school. And I was going to the office and the door swings open. And here comes a kid and tells the secretary, you are a B, you know? Oh. And the secretary turns around to her, to the kid, and says, you are a B. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know? Yeah. What am I doing here? And the, the level of roughness, 
not not roughness always, but of being raw in that school was intense, right? So the kids would say, you know, this is so boring. We don't understand. You tell us the same thing every day. What's going on? We don't want to hear about thought. And, you know, it was not like in a polite way. It was like on your face, on your face, mm-hmm. on your face, on your face, right? <coughs> we would come up with an idea and they didn't want to have anything to do with it. Nothing. Um, they didn't want to engage. And they, were, the- they did not want to engage. They, they were talking. They were... Uh, I mean, they were just rude at times, right? Did it ever cross and your I mind remember, to, to give up on it? Or did that ever, did that ever cross your mind and, and you plow through it? Or, or is that ever a question for you to kind of give up on that kind of thing? It never, that never crossed my mind. Mm-hmm. But what, what, what crossed my mind often was, what am I doing here? And is, does this really, is this really creating any impact? You know, like, does this really create impact? Because... I think what happens also with kids is generally they won't up to you and tell you, oh, you know, thank you so much. What I'm learning from you has changed my life. Like adults will tell you that more readily, <laughs> but kids won't. So for a whole year we were in doubt and, you know, we would try and do our best. And then sometimes we're like, okay, we're just going to bring something to eat or, um, you know, we just, I didn't know what to do. Sometimes I just did not know what to do. I mean, the only thing that I knew is like, okay, you know, I'm just going to buy them a sandwich because they're hungry or I'm just going to let them talk because they need to. And what happened towards the end of the year is that Lone Pine publishers through Amy, uh, effort came to the school and they did a recording, right? They were going to go uh, classroom to classroom to classroom and record the kids and see if there was anything that would come up with that mm-hmm. we could share. And I was like, Oh my gosh, <laughs> what are work. we doing? Yeah. What are we doing? You know? And what the kids said was amazing, Dennis. I mean, what the kids said were, uh, we were like, what? They're actually having insights. This is actually helping. And you didn't know for the whole year that it was actually helping them? Is it? No, you know, we were, we noticed that they started warming up with us a little bit more, right? Mm-hmm. But, I, I mean, there was one particular girl that I just had a hard time with because she was kind of like on my face a lot and she was really harsh, you know? And she started talking about being in an abused relationship as a young teenager and mm-hmm. how this really helped her to realize that she res- this, uh, deserved better. She says, you know, I deserve better. I don't need this. Mm-hmm. And so, so, so going through that helped me understand that that mind, you know, that the intelligence of life that is present in every one of us is at work always. And that it has like a resonance on people, right? And that maybe, and that maybe while you're in the class or, you know, in the coaching session, there's nothing gigantic that happens. But then it can happen at any moment. And so it gave me great certainty that even if I don't see a tremendous result immediately, that that doesn't mean that there is not something happening. That's it, yeah. You know? It's kind of like in learning too. When you're learning stuff, you for a few weeks, a few months, you mightn't feel like you're learning much after after that initial kind of like few months of your learning stuff, and then you see a lot of progress. You go through a dip where you go weeks and months, and you would think you're not learning anything, and then all of a sudden another day it'll click again. It kind of goes through periods where it clicks, and then periods. Of, I I just kind of view it as a test of will. It's like you're going, you're continuously doing something, and you're doing it on faith that something's going in. And mm-hmm. kind of from what I'm hearing from you there as well, it's like you're doing the year there where you, where you didn't really know whether there was results or not, but you had that faith that you were doing something and, I, and uh, then you were, I suppose you got a really good result at the end as well on top of it. Yeah, you know, it was kind of, I, I mean, there were many times, to be perfectly honest with you, that I would go in the bathroom and, you know, Amy and I would take turns as far as just like going in the bathroom and kind of like praying or saying, you know, like, mm. <laughs> okay, let me come down and 
let me be of service, you know. I, I think what happened is, is that the kids really notice our intention. Yeah. You know, I mean, they, they noticed that we wanted to support them. And then what I realized was, you know, these kids, this particular group of kids had social workers, had probation officers, had special teams working with them. And they had a lot of people telling them things all day long, you know? Mm-hmm. And they were with them from the perspective of there's something wrong with you and there's something really uh, urgent that needs to change. Mm-hmm. What I realized at some point was, you know, if I can just be with them for a day, 40 minutes a day, human being to human being, just appreciating their soul, appreciating their their character, appreciating their particular form, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's going to be helpful. And actually, I learned that from Roger, from Dr. Roger Mills. Um, he had this capacity of being with people and really seeing the true essence of who they were. And I noticed in working with him that people noticed this and it impacted, it had a therapeutic effect on them. I, I remember that. I remember thinking, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to be with them. And, and so I noticed that that really uh, changes the game of coaching and teaching this thing that we call state of mind, you know, there's a lot of things that we can say and all of that and people can learn. But what I have found most helpful is when we just are present with people, truly seeing that they are the principles in action, that they are not their circumstances, that they're not their behavior, really. And how people can tell and then they start listening to their own wisdom, you know, Mm. And maybe that is what happens, and maybe that's what happened with the five-year-old that I told you, that she said, you know, I just need a hug. I think we have a tendency to overteach and overshare. Mm -hmm. And when we are just present, it gives space in the conversation for the other person to hear their their own soul. And what can be more powerful than that, right? That's it. It's changing. Well, yeah, it's changing the dynamic. It's like... Number one, it takes the pressure off me to have to teach something to somebody. And number two, it's actually because it's actually quite rare. We do get those situations where somebody's with training when you're listening to you and they're drawing out whatever is within you. And because uh, a lot of times, too, it's like when there's stuff on your mind, it's hard to concentrate. Or it's hard to even get about your own life when there's stuff on your mind. But when you get into a situation where somebody's listening to you, you can just get it off your chest and move on a bit. And um that's actually how I view growth as well and, and uh, change is actually it's when you don't even notice it. It's just like you just look at things differently. You don't even notice that you're looking at things differently until like a couple mm-hmm. of months later. You're like, oh, that's not an issue for me anymore or whatever. That's when I kind of look at change and I go like that's actual proper real change that's happened there. Um, so, yeah. And then I think that's important. You know, the thing that I like to do is to point that out too, hmm. if it's possible, you know to really point out the many insights people have, the many insights kids have. Um, I really think it's important for me as a professional to help people discover that the source of healing or the source of direction or the source of insight is really them, you know? I, I love working with people and at the end of the day for them to realize that they have a resource uh, that can never leave them, right? Mm-hmm. And that they, no ma- like no matter what, this resource will will guide them. You know, and I think personally for me, that that was just such a wonderful thing to realize that, 
you know, life can be tough, right? Life can can be challenging and life life events can mm. be intense. Um, we had an earthquake in Mexico not too long ago and we had a client that uh, her building collapsed on her, right? And she was alive, she was rescued and all of that. And then, you know, the, then I had a friend like in the same week that the, earth, the uh, hurricane happened in Puerto Rico. And then it was another earthquake in Mexico and then another earthquake in Puerto Rico. So it was just like, you know, and, and as a human being, I just felt like what's happening, what's going on. So even though I understand this state of mind and this wisdom, there are moments where, you know, of course, life feels challenging. And what has always helped my soul so much is to remember, wait, there's something deeper that's going to see me through. And I have reflected upon my life and I have seen how many times I have um, had moments of lots of challenges and then every time, you know, there's like a little, a little road or a little way or a little sense of okay already and then sure little by little I'll start having a direction or having a sense of hope or having a sense of you know just go to the couch and lay down right now and get a cup of tea Mm. so the reason what I keep on teaching this and the reason why this has been so central in my life is because I really have seen time and time again that the whole universe is behind us, right? And that as human beings, regardless of the situation, little by little, we are able to, to rise. You know, and especially this year, I think with so many natural events happening here in the Americas, and it just sort of felt like you know, punching back for like a month and a half, it just felt like really intense. And uh, as I started looking into like Facebook or, you know, the different social media, there were so many people that came up with ideas about how to be helpful. Mm. Right? Like in Mexico City in particular, because it doesn't have an infrastructure of a lot of support and finances the way that the States has. I mean, people were shoulder to shoulder, moving rubble and coming up with, you know, a sandwich or, or whatever they can do. And so, so, so understanding that and observing that in my own life has allowed me to have a gentle experience of life and a sense of relief, Mm. you know, that, um, Sure, I will feel stress, I will feel sad, I will feel concerned. And then something will search like it always does, and it will start opening up a path for me. And if and that is wonderful. It's mm. wonderful for me to <clears throat> to remember that. And that's really why I, I share the principles. And wow. that's why I'm so committed to, you know. Yeah. So, did you ever think it's too late for somebody to not, uh, I suppose, to change and kind of to see something different? Say, they might be in a situation where they've gotten gone down the rabbit hole so far. It seems like they're not going to be able to perceive the world in a different way. In your experience, is there ever a situation where it's too late for somebody? Or, well, I know that there are some people that are going to die. Hmm. Um, you know, my own mother died of alcoholism. I know that we've worked with clients here in Santa Clara County that had um, recovered from alcohol use or drug use, and then they relapsed, and they're on the streets for a while, you know. I know that. I also know that I've seen people that have had, you know, 30 years of heroin use, and then they have an insight. And there, there's a beautiful, beautiful film that it's called A Place Like No Other that was done 
based on a homeless shelter in Los Angeles on Skid Row. And there was a there was a man there named Ray, and Ray had been a heroin addict for for thirty years. And you know, Skid Row is an intense place in Los Angeles. Mm. And he had an insight, and he ended up getting better. And he got off the heroin, off the streets, and ended up having an apartment for two years with a girlfriend. You know, before he passed. Mm. So, do I think that? Uh, everyone's going to get an insight and they're not going to suffer. No, I think some people are going to suffer and I think some of us will end up dying. But I also know that that what we're talking about here is, you know, the power of God, really, the power of the spiritual, mm. right? The power of of life. We're talking about the the power of of a little seed being able to grow, right? Mm. We're talking about the power of two cells creating a human. And so I what I have seen is that there's no limitations. It's limitless pretty much, yeah. Yeah, there's no limitations. So I've seen that, you know, uh, physically people that thought they were going to stay in a certain state of, of physical uh, illness, and then they don't. Mm. We, we, we had somebody that in the county that came on a wheelchair because they had a really bad arthritis, and now they're walking and playing golf because they realized that their fear of experiencing pain was so powerful in them that that's what debilitated them not so much the arthritis so you know um i think i think insight can show up at any time i think um love and kindness can show up any time i think mm. hope can show up at any time I mean, I've seen it. Yeah. I've seen it a lot. So Perfect. And uh, actually, I just wanted to touch on as well your book. So you co-wrote a book called uh, Lita, La Friolita. So I've read some of it. And yes. I, I really like the animations and um, the story. Um, could you just give us a brief kind of summary of the story? And how did you think of even creating that book? Okay, well, the theme, the, the central theme of, the book really is greatly based on all the work that I've done with in schools. And so what happened is that a few years ago, uh, a gentleman by the name of Antonio Luis Gomez Molero, which is a wonderful writer and the writer of this book, and I started talking about writing a book. He said, you know, I really think we should write a book. And so he had the idea of let's let's just come up with something and uh, at one point, he had said, well, maybe I can interview you. You know, we could just write that down. And then, you know, because he has two young, beautiful daughters, we came up on this idea of let's let's talk about what happens to kids and particularly what happens to kids at school when they're experiencing difficulties. And what happens with kids at school when they're experiencing difficulties is that they... Um, they no longer experience school as a fun place, you know, it's mm. like quite stressful. And the adults around them start getting very serious. And, you know, at least in the States, this is really common in my experience, you know. Um, we forget to see the kid and we just see the problem, yeah. right? So so our main character, Lita, who lives in Beanland, uh, <laughs> She loves um, baking, baking class, but hates math class. And so she falls asleep during math class, ends up being yelled at. She gets demoted. And she's quite upset about that. And so at night, she starts thinking about all of what's happened during the day. And so the monster, the thought monster, kind of starts getting created, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, the parents are very worried, which is really what happens, you know, when kids are experiencing difficulties at school, parents get very worried, and, and then uh, they're concerned, the kids are concerned, 
and she ends up going to the benologist, right? And the benologist just tries to help them through different um, methodologies mm -hmm. and, um, of course, gives them medication because, you know, here in the States also, I think, um, uh, getting medications for kids for ADHD or anything like that, it's, it's quite easy, unfortunate. Mm -hmm. And then the medication gives them side effects. And so we were really wondering how do we show side effects and stress in a children's book. And so her hair changes colors, you know, it goes from brown to magenta and it starts sparkling and bubbles and the whole thing. And, and then she gets so caught up into her own problem that she actually blows a, a bubble around her, you know, and she just is like caught into her little bubble, which is actually really what happens to us, mm -hmm. right? We're so caught up in our own thinking sometimes that we create our own little bubble of thought. And yeah. so in the story, Lita actually ends up flying away and um, flying through Beanland until she hits, uh, she bumps up on the, um, oh my God, Arcoiris, uh, the rainbow, right? And she starts also noticing how beautiful Beanland is. And she comes down and ends up talking to Doña Frijo, which is a little old lady that has two blue dogs. And um, she's the, the person in, in Beanland that can see hmm. kids, even when they're having problems. And so she starts playing with her and talking to her and explains to her that she's thinking, and that is the problem, and not to worry because this thought's going to pass through. And so as Lita starts having a clearer mind, she's able to realize some misunderstandings that she had about her day, and her hair starts, you know, going back to a normal, and she goes back to school and tries to experience school, you know, with joy and all of that. So the illustrations as you as you notice they're mm. amazing uh paul ortega which is an amazing amazing illustrator uh and conti silly who's the publisher uh were just incredible you know and so this little book is now uh, going to be presented actually this coming weekend which will be december 2nd 2017 at the international book fair in Guadalajara, Mexico. So they get accepted, we're going to go, we're going to present it. And, um, you know, I, I really think that this could be used in schools to give kids a sense of, you know, even if you have a problem, you're okay. And also for adults, you know, mm. it is my hope that, that in reading this book, adults realize that well, you know, like I told you with that little five-year-old girl, mm -hmm. kids are insightful and sometimes the only thing that needs to happen is for us to sit down and really listen. And when we really listen, we're able to, to get a sense of really how to support them. And sometimes they're very clear mm -hmm. as to how, you know, how we can be helpful. So sometimes we could even learn something from them as well about our own situation. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's Lita, yeah. and it's also it's also on Amazon for those of you that want to. Yeah, I just bought it myself it. as well. Actually, it was like uh, I wanted to read a little bit in Spanish to give up my own Spanish, and uh, yeah, it's a really nice book. It's like it's, it's colorful. I think kids would like it, even um, even if they don't speak Spanish, it'll be kind of nice illustrations and stuff, and uh, they can learn a few Spanish words as well. Then I think as well. Right, and you know, there's. I mean, we're we're talking about. Um, translating it there's somebody that's very interested in translating it into italian and then english and all of that you know so we'll see actually we'll one see, question you know. i wanted to ask you too do you, do you notice the way you express things in spanish and english do they is there any differences like when you try and get across stuff about state of mind and the principles to people do you ever find any differences between spanish and english actually in the words itself is there any limitations in either language or different ways of saying things yeah Yes, Dennis, um, you know, it, I learned to share the, the principles in English. Um, and then uh, 
then I started sharing them in, in Spanish. And one of the first limitations is that in English, there's not a different word for consciousness, consciousness and conscience. It's the same word. Consciousness and conscience. You know, I mean, we have translated as conciencia, you know, and other things, but really, it's always like, okay, the point is not the words, right? Like mm. Sid, Sid used to say, Sidney Beck used to say, the point is not the word. The, the words are not the point. Yeah. And then, and then that's true also, I think, with kids and in Spanish and, you know, with all the different populations that I've worked with, it's never really about repeating the words. It's about, okay... What's the point, mm. right? So, so that has been a little challenging at times. And there's sometimes when I'm uh, sharing the principles in Spanish that I'll forget a word or I'll get stuck in something, you know. So, but people are are helpful, you know, and people kind of come up and say, "Oh, this is what you want to say." Mm. So yeah, you know, I think the form can always get tricky because we get used to to sharing the form, and so. So I'm learning <laughs> again. That's true. No, it's just something, it's something that kind of fascinated me between languages that there are certain things you can't actually articulate in one language, you can articulate in another language. But actually what you're saying there is actually more important than it's not actually the words. It's kind of the sense of where somebody's coming from and their understanding, their embodied understanding of what they're saying is what's important with the principles and state of mind. Um, that's what I've seen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you see, that, I mean, I think that's also like with cultures or, you know, I've worked with migrant workers, um, Latin mig migrant workers that are working in the field. So I've done training with them. And then I've also worked with executives, right? And so <clears throat> that's what I was telling you that working with the kids was so helpful for me, because in that experience, what I learned is like, I need to get so present. So that when I'm sharing, it's not a bunch of words and mm. ideas, but something really powerful that people can can find helpful, right? Mm. And so <clears throat> I don't want people to learn lingo. I want people to see something about life. And so whether I'm teaching in Spanish or whether I'm working with kids or whether I'm working with adults, you know, from different, um, from different religions, from different cultures, right? Mm -hmm. My listening is always attending. Mm, it's almost like the first phase for me is always like listening, you know, like I'm just listening. And then as I listen, it occurs to me how to share. Yeah, I would I would describe that um, as, you know, I just kind of want to get a sense, you know, like in the first, like maybe, I don't know, 15 minutes of a movie that you don't know what it's about. And you're just like trying to get a sense of what is this movie about, yeah. right? So when I sit with somebody, that's kind of what the experience that I get is like, you know, what what's going on here? And just really, really wanting to understand uh, and get a sense. That's it. Or when you go, oh, you know. even if you're going on a date, a date with somebody or something after the first, you kind of get a sense of what they're like mm -hmm. after the first 15, 20 minutes or so. It's kind of by listening to them, I guess. Mm. So. Well, I would say a couple of dates, but. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, would say, I would say, give them more than 15 minutes. <laughs> Maybe I'm a bit more efficient. Husband, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to give my husband more like 12 dates. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's true. Well, yeah, I suppose a different scenario, yeah. But, uh, yeah, but you know what? Right. Actually, that's a good point because sometimes it has taken me a long time to really understand what really, what really is the, what's really the, the point here. Yeah. yeah, the crux of it. Yeah. Of the issue. I mean, sometimes what I've noticed is like I'll start listening to somebody and then I'll think that I have an idea and then I'll present something and the, then I can tell, no, this is not an idea because there is an immediate resistance right mm. so i'm like okay let me listen more and so i mean honestly like in a lot of, of the work that i've done sometimes my listening is 40 minutes because i'm just like you know i don't know and sometimes i mean i've worked with people that we i, I work with this kid she was 21 years old we had five sessions total 
And the first four sessions were like, what's going on? Because I have no idea. So I just really, I just really have learned the value of being with somebody without any intention in my mind, you know, without any plan, without just really wanting to mm. get the sense of this human being. I said, instead of jumping in there, thinking you have the answer, that, that's kind of what I've seen too. It's like, sometimes you'll think that, oh, I know this problem from somewhere before, and you've got this urge to kind of jump in, but then actually, if you just listened a bit longer, you might realize, oh, it wasn't that problem at all. Mm-hmm. And it, mm-hmm. I was, it's even with programming as well, there, there's a guy, John Sabna, is a simple programmer, and he was saying that when you get a problem to solve, if you've got four hours to solve it, spend the first three you're actually reading the question and then just kind of map it out because oftentimes people answer the wrong question to begin with so they could spend the four hours doing something that's not even what was asked. And it's the same Absolutely. for me there with that kind of thing as well, I think. Absolutely. I think, you know, I've seen how many of us, and, you know, me included, I've, I've had this uh, quickness to teach, right? Hmm. and it goes nowhere and it's like oh well yeah because I didn't understand really and so I see time and time again how important it is really to be present so you can understand you know and so so I I think that's really uh, that's really just important Hmm. you know to be willing to really be with somebody and not know yeah, being comfortable with the unknown, I suppose, too, yeah. Oh, that's right. Well, my favorite my favorite book of the principles is The Missing Link. Um, you know, when I read The Missing Link, I just, I just have, I just feel like my heart swells up, mm. you know. I feel lighter. Uh, I feel kind of lighter sometimes when I'm reading these books. It feels mm-hmm. like... It just because it's simple and it just it just seems true and it's kind of like I don't know I just get it's kind of like a meditative state it's kind of just relaxed kind of I don't know yeah yeah I really 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 like the missing link a lot because I feel um, you know there's like the quote there's one of my favorite quotes that is um, anyone at any time can have a brand new thought that changes their lives. Mm. Um, and I just have been, you know, I, I, the way that I read this particular book is I just read a little bit and then whenever I feel touched, I just, you know, close it and put it away and stuff. But I really, I really, really, really like that one. Another book that has been really helpful and raw and, uh, real is a book by Jack Pransky, seduced by consciousness because you know sometimes you get the sense that okay you you learn about this and then your life is perfect right and then Mm -hmm. nothing happens and you go off sailing in the distance in the ocean with a perfect sunrise and or sunset and that's just not it Mm -hmm. and so i really like the 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 realness of this book you know and i think jack absolutely put himself out there uh, with lots of personal stories and and I appreciate that I appreciate mm. when when we say you know what yes as a human being I continue to struggle sometimes and I have blind spots and yes life feels like it's swallowing me sometimes but I, I'm still here and so you know I think sometimes uh, sometimes there is a sense of like well life becomes utopic and you know mm. Nothing, nothing touches you, and you know, and that has not been my experience, and so that's that's why I really appreciated that book. Yeah, you know, Jack, uh, he presented some research, I think, on t- in Tikkun last year, and um, him and somebody else, and I'm terrible with names, but anyway, sorry, you'll have to yeah. look it up, but. Um, they, they have been doing this this research as to okay you know what what is really happening with the principles you know is that it really um, what seems to to be impactful etc and what what they have found out is that 
they divided, divided the research into two parts. One of them is um, the creation of illusion, okay? So they, they, they measure what happens to the different parts of your understanding or your life when you understand that you're creating an illusion moment to moment to moment via the principles. Okay. And the other thing they measured is what happens to your life when you understand that there is a true essence in you that cannot be impacted regardless mm-hmm. of what's going on. And maybe I'm, I'm defining it a little bit different. But what they found out is that what seems to be most helpful to people is when they understand that there is an essence and a oneness to us that is indestructible and that is there. And that when you understand that, that has a tremendous impact in many different areas of your life. And so I just thought that was re- really relevant for those of us that are sharing the principles because we often only talk about thought, mm-hmm. right? And that's helpful. But what seems to have a deeper sense of impact is also, you know, it's really the both both things right the, the creation of illusion yes mm-hmm. we're creating an illusion moment to moment and most impactful according to the research is this sense of uh, essence and oneness and resiliency and all of that i i you know i would invite anyone to um, look at this research actually i'm sure if you contact jack or i think it was in tikkun it was presented in tikkun so i'm sure there's video of that Cool. And thanks for thanks for taking the time to, to join us today, Gabriella, and uh, for sharing your what you've been doing in the world. Um, is there any way for people to contact you, or what are you working at now these days? Or <laughs> yes, I I need to be better um, positioned um, because it's it's not so easy to contact me. But I'll you, I'll give you my um, very complicated email. You okay. can put it in the link, and then yeah. you can also contact me through Facebook. I think Facebook is probably the easiest for people. Mm. Um, and it was a pleasure being with you today and thank you for doing the interview no problem the pleasure is all mine so until next time have fun and enjoy the process